Let us pray. God, bless us and surprise us with your power and wisdom during this time of proclamation. Amen. Well, during the season of Lent, MCCLV continues with a series titled, Get Off Your Cross and Follow Me. The 40 days of Lent present us with multiple opportunities to think on and pray about where we are at spiritually. Where could we be following Jesus more faithfully? Are we up to date on giving grace and mercy? Or are we a little rusty? Are we holding on to something that needs to be released? Is our spiritual health solid or do we need to make some changes? The specific question that is set in front of us today in the gospel reading is one of perspective. Are we operating out of short-term thinking or are we thinking eternally? Are we focused on, on what we want in the temporary or are we focused on what God wants for us in the long term? Now, I think one of the best inventions in the world is the French fry. <laughs> I like almost any kind of French fry. I like this, amen, I like the skinny French fries, the steak fry, the crinkle cut fry, let's not forget the waffle fry, and I recently, here, here, and I recently fell in love with the fresh cut fry. I eat French fries and it seems like all is right with the world for a short while. The, you see, the French fry, unfortunately, it does not last. I eat French fries and I'm on top of the world. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. But then there is that crash. The French fries do not continue on for very long. And then there is the lentil, the inexpensive and unheralded lentil. Red lentils, green lentils, uh, brown lentils. On my Sabbath day, I'll make a batch of soup for the week ahead. And every few weeks, I'll make some red lentil stew. It's about seven servings, uh, put it in canning jars, you know, freeze some of it, eat it throughout the week. And I, I want to look forward to digging into the healthy goodness of the lentils. I really want to, to look forward to it. But, but with a very downtrodden posture and a very sad look on my face, I'll drag myself into the kitchen here at the church. I'll take my lentil soup out of the refrigerator. I'll heat it up in the microwave. There's no singing of pop songs. There's, there's no happy dance. But the lentil soup ma lasts a whole lot longer than those uh, french fries. The lentil soup sustains me. For hours, though it doesn't have the fun, the kick, the pizzazz of the french fries. Now likewise, eternal life does not seem very important when we put it up against the pressures that we're under day to day. There is money to be made, there is power to seek, there is fame to find, there is technology to control in our favor. We are constantly trained and taught by the culture to seek after the short term. It's a rare occasion to be invited to ponder the long term, the sustainable. Now we may think that this is a topic only for 2015, but even in ancient times, people were confronted with the debate between the short term and the eternal. You know, that person featured in the scripture passage today, they are a lot like us. This person has one part of their being wrapped up in short term things. Yet this young man also has a curiosity about the eternal. This young man, he goes up to Jesus, wants to know how to inherit eternal life. And Jesus answers the man's question with a question, first off. And then he directs the young person to keep the commandments. Here's what you need to do, kid. Keep the commandments. Now, the young man has no problem with that. He responds, I have kept all of the commandments. What still do I lack? And I love that this young person really wants answers. He doesn't want to just accept a basic response from Jesus. This young man really wants a deeper spiritual understanding. And Jesus responds to the young man that if he wishes to be perfect, he is then to go sell his possessions, give his money to the poor, have treasure in heaven, and then follow Jesus. And this answer from Jesus really bums out the young man. Scripture tells us that he went away grieving because he had a lot of stuff. Now, we don't know if the guy was a hoarder, but the Bible does tell us that this young man had many possessions. 
Now, after this interaction with the young man, Jesus turns to his disciples, tells them how hard it will be for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And there may be some people here in the sanctuary who are thinking at this point, phew, I'm off the hook today. I don't have a lot of possessions. I'm not rich, so I'm good with God. But... The point of the passage is not the specifics of what keeps people from eternal things. The point is that every single one of us, we all have blockages and barriers to eternal thinking. Though we do need to focus for just a moment on how having too much stuff keeps us away from God and keeps us away from eternal things. I'll never forget a member of MCCLV coming out about her stuff. It was during class one night. It was about... Ten years ago, she came out, she came clean about having too many possessions. She had accumulated many things over the years, clothes, knickknacks, dishes, but these things did not fill her spiritually. And her testimony really helped all of us take a closer look at our things, to think of our stuff in a, a different way. But if we don't have too many possessions, there is no call to gloat today because, again, we all have obstacles to thinking and acting eternally. If it's not possessions that keep us from God, it may be unforgiveness. If it's not unforgiveness that keeps us from God, well, it may be ego. If it's not ego that keeps us from God, it may be distractions. There's a long list a long list of things that may keep us from God. But how much better it is to know what is keeping us from the long term and the eternal. I'd much rather know than not know. And I hope that if I were to be in a situation like this young man with Jesus, I hope I'd pester Jesus. I hope I'd ask him, where am I off? Where still do I lack? But in knowing what's keeping me from an eternal frame of mind, I wonder if I would go away grieving like the young man who had many possessions. Thankfully, there is such good news in the scripture passage today. Jesus tells the disciples about the impossibility of rich folks entering heaven, and the disciples are astonished. They ask, well, who then can be saved? If the rich folks don't get it, who else is going to get it? And scripture tells us that Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but for God all things are possible. And with this we may all breathe a hefty sigh of relief. Entry into eternal, long-term spiritual sustainability is not at all based on our merits. Amen? It's not about who's been around the longest time or who is the smartest. It's not about who's able to do tech the best or who is the most talented, or who has the most money, or who is the most physically fit, or who is the most well-spoken. Eternity is not something achieved or earned. It's not awarded, and it is not far off. So eternity is something we embrace or do not embrace in the here and now. Everyone receives a divine invitation to eternity. And again, we may embrace this eternal perspective or we may choose not to embrace it. Eternity comes from the prompting of God. Now, God is not a tease. God is not teasing us with promises of eternity. Eternity is real. It's always before us, behind us, around us, above us, within us, beyond us. And it's definitely not subject to our ideas about time. But this doesn't seem to square very well with Ash Wednesday. After all, we started off our Lenten season on Ash Wednesday. We received ashes on our foreheads with those words, you are dust and to dust you shall return. That seems pretty final. There's a, the a theologian, his name is Paul Tillich, and he wrote about our inescapable end that it is our destiny, it is the destiny of everything in our world that we must come to an end. But there's nothing to fear. There is nothing to be anxious about with the end because of the eternal. It is the eternal now which provides for us an earthly now. 
You see, theologian Tillich explains that there are some people, they're held by the past, and they cannot separate themselves from it. There are some people who escape to the future, unable to rest in the present. You see, for Tillich, every moment of time reaches into the eternal. Every moment of time reaches into the eternal. Some of us, we get stuck in the past. Some of us, we escape to the future. And Tillich thinks that this is a characteristic of the modern age, that we lack the courage to accept being present because we've lost the dimension of the eternal. But there is no need to lose hope. If we are estranged from the present, if we are separated from the present time, we return to Christ, the one who was and is to come, the beginning and the end. Christ gives us forgiveness for what has passed, and Christ gives us courage for what is to come. And we are given rest in Christ's eternal presence, and we are all desperately need desperately in need of this blessed eternal rest. One of the things I've, I've started to focus on more this year is being present with people. And being present is much more difficult than we may at first imagine. Being present means we do not treat others based on our past interactions with them and what we know about their history. And this goes against almost everything we've been taught, right? As we typically fall back on our past experience as a guide to our present. But when we go back to the past, we're not approaching things with an eternal mindset. So being present also means that we do not escape to the future so that we may avoid dealing with people in the present. We are actually quite skilled at making an escape to the future. It's an easier place to be oftentimes than the present. So Tillich, this theologian, Paul Tillich, he's right to say that it takes courage to be present, to enter into that eternal rest in the here and now. We have to be very brave to be present with people. We have to put aside any previous experience as well as any future anxiety. But what I have found as I focus more on being present, and I have a long way to go, what I've found, though, is that it's a very rich way to live. Not rich, of course, in money, right? But rich in its depth. In a wonderfully weird sort of way, living more eternally, living in that eternal now, brings about a way of living that is much more grounded. Now, when we think at first of people who are living in the eternal now, we may think, well, they're pretty flaky, right? Living in the eternal now, what's, what's that about? But we have much to learn from those who have a more eternal perspective. When living in the eternal now, there's a sense of peace. There's an understanding of the flow of life like the ocean. Life has tides, right? Living tidally is living in the present, which has been pointed out to us by Tillich, gives us eternal rest. And this sounds profoundly relaxing to me, that idea of eternal rest. That sounds profoundly relaxing in a world that seems to be more interested in being eternally wired and when, when we are at eternal rest and living presently, it gives God a chance. It gives God some, some room to uh, work some recreating in us. And one of the things I enjoy about the portrayal of Jesus in the Gospels is that there are constant reversals. What we, held, what we long held to be true turns out to be upside down and backwards. You see, today's passage ends with a ticked-off Peter. P Peter is ticked off. He's responding to Jesus out of future anxiety, right, rather than being present with Jesus. You see, Jesus has just given a teaching about breaking down barriers to God, and Peter lashes out, Hey, Jesus, we've given up about just about everything to follow you, and what are we going to get out of this? Well, Jesus assures Peter and the other disciples that everyone who has given up family relations, everyone who's given up property will receive more than they ever imagined. And anyone in the sanctuary here today who has ever had to surrender spiritually 
has ever had to give over the things of home or family or livelihood for Christ, then you know that it is a great risk. It's traveling out into the unknown. But in turn, we receive a hundredfold, says Jesus. A hundredfold? A hundredfold of, of what? Well, the reward is not money or recognition, but the inheritance of eternal life. And a lot of the time, we prefer money for our troubles, right? It's why we dream of lottery winnings. It's why we dream of hitting it big somehow. But let's not forget the theologian Jessie J, and she sings in her song Price Tag. What? It's not about the it's not about the money, thank you. It's not about the money, the money, the money. Forget about the price tag. Amen, Jesse J. A lot of our singers are theologians. Praise be to God. It's not about the money. It's not about the possessions. It's not about the stuff. It's not about the accolades. It's not about the tenure or any of that. And this is where the reversal comes in. Jesus' last words in this passage are, many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. You know, because our culture is focused so much on, on who wins and whose opinion wins, who receives the most likes, we have to be so careful to avoid this in our spiritual lives. We don't need to be at the front of the line to be okay spiritually. Amen? We could have been in last place in the 800-yard run at school. We could have been in last place in sales at our company. We could have the smallest place in the neighborhood. That does not matter. The victories and the priorities of a spiritual life are a lot different than what prevails in the culture around us. The last shall be first is a radical change to our way of thinking. Having an eternal perspective places us, it places us on the fringes of society. And that's perfectly okay because what Christ is calling us to today is is a life that's not focused on what most people want. When we come down off our cross, when we follow Jesus, it rarely goes according to plan or expectation. When we take more steps into the eternal life that is set before us right now, it will be a bit unsettling at first because it's such a different way of being. We're going to find ourselves being patient in ways we've never been before. We'll find ourselves talking with people we wouldn't have spoken with previously. We will find ourselves being gracious in situations where we have never acted graciously before. Welcome to the eternal life. It's not by our power. It's due to God from whom all things are possible. And so let us pray. And let's pray especially today for that eternal perspective for thinking more eternally. And we want to ask forward today here to the altar area, the communion table area. We want to ask forward today anyone who may be struggling with an eternal perspective, with living in the eternal now. Anyone who wants to live more in the present. We ask that you come forward. We want to pray over you. We want to pray with you. Anyone who has the gift of laying on of hands, if you could also come forward at this time and lay hands. Again, we ask forward anyone here today who wants to do less of focusing on the past, less of escaping into the future, anyone who wants to live more presently, which is to live more eternally. It's a difficult thing, God. We're pretty used to dealing with people on the basis of, of our past experiences. We're, we're pretty skilled, God, you know this. We're pretty skilled at taking off for the future. You know how much we avoid being in the presence. There's, there's no hiding it, God. There's no hiding from you. But you know the heart of everyone here who has come forward. Those who have not come forward, if you could just maintain positive prayer energy, 
focus your prayer on those who have come forward. Let's pray for presence for those who have come forward. Let's pray for the presence of God. Let's pray for an, outpour, an outpouring of that eternal perspective, which is now, which is here. Eternity is not just something far off, far away. Eternity is now. God, we want that eternal perspective. We know that our thoughts are not your thoughts, God. But we want less of us and, and more of you in our thinking. We want more of you, God, in our lives. We trust that when we, we turn to you, we receive from you. We are ready, God. We are ready to live more for you. We are ready to live more centered lives, lives that are more about you and your way and your word. God, uh, we know that there are some who have, who have come forward or, or are in the sanctuary today who are, are feeling uh, pretty chained to the past, feeling like that past just has a grip. And so we ask for an outpouring and overflowing of your wonderful forgiveness, Lord. And help us to live in that forgiveness, embrace that forgiveness. It no longer matters, God, whatever that was. You've forgiven it. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. You've, you've forgiven us. And you know, God, too, that there are people here who are leaping into the future. <laughs> anything, anything in the future is really attractive, just so that we don't have to deal with what's right now, here and now. Pull us back, God. Pull us back to the present moment, Lord. because it's in that present moment that we experience your power and your energy working through us. Life changes, life transforms. Help us to be present, God. To be present, live more in you, live more in your spirit. Help us to be present with one another, God. Really hear one another, really see you in one another. You know, God, it's, it's by living more in the present, by having that, that eternal perspective, that eternal thinking. We can live out your gifts more, God. We can say, here we are, Lord. We're ready to serve you. We're ready to do your will in the world. God bless each person who has come forward here. Let's continue our prayer for, for those who have come forward. Let hearts be healed. Let everyone know that God is with us. God is never going to leave us or forsake us. God's steadfast love is forever. God's mercy is from generation to generation. God, you are here. You are present. And we thank you, God, for your presence. Help us to go now. Be present to one another and live in your presence more and more. You may be seated. God is with you. We thank you and praise you, God, for this opportunity to pray for one another, to pray on one another, to let you, God, to let your love and your grace work through us for good. God, continue being with us. Continue your presence, your powerful presence with us, we pray. Amen.